afternoon, good evening, and welcome to Traders Workshop for Tuesday, February 21st. I'll be your host, Tom Schneider, CMT with Ninja Trader. And here at Traders Workshop, what we like to do is we like to showcase the experts from our Ninja Trader ecosystem. So the Ninja Trader ecosystem is where you as a, a Ninja Trader user can go and find what other Ninja Trader users are doing, look at their tools, just benefit from their expertise. And this week is no different. I can't wait to tell you about my new guest. He's first time on, in, on uh, Trader's Workshop. But before we get into that, I do want to remind everybody that futures and options trading contains substantial risk is not for every trader. You could potentially lose all or even more than all of your initial investment. That's why we recommend you use risk capital. What is risk capital? It's money you can afford to lose. It doesn't keep you up at night. It doesn't extend your retirement horizon. I also want to remind you that Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Very important to know. And also that what we talk about in this program contains neither trade recommendations nor financial advice, but should be taken only for educational purposes. And with that, I would like to welcome, it's my, my pleasure to welcome Chris Mercer. He is the president of Tradesite.com and a longtime Ninja Trader ecosystem partner. How are you doing, Chris? I'm great. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I'm I'm doing okay. It's uh, uh pretty pretty nice here. I'm on the East Coast. It's uh, we we haven't seen an, anything really sub freezing for a while now. I think we have one day in the next two weeks where we'll we'll get below freezing, but otherwise it's 40s and 50s. Where are you, Chris? Uh, I'm in Phoenix. I'm in Chandler, Arizona, and uh, it is doing something unusual. It's raining here today. So, what are you gonna oh. do? And it, but otherwise, you know, being yeah in the desert, you don't get a lot of rain. I don't think I've ever been out there when it's been raining. Knock on wood, I've been there a lot. But yep. um, you know, the weather certainly uh, envious of the weather in Phoenix. I love the heat. <laughs> yep, it's usually quite nice. We've had a cold winter, but uh, you know, it's time for it to warm up again here. Nice, nice. So, Chris, uh, just so people people know, again, Chris is the president of TradeSite dot com, and you know, just curious how you got into the markets where did your interest in the markets begin and you know how did you get to trade site eventually yeah um well it goes back quite a ways actually i was always interested in the markets i went to uh, college for economics and finance related stuff and uh my after my sophomore year i was at uh, uc san diego in la jolla california and after my sophomore year i just decided i didn't want to go back home for the summer i wanted to stay there and I ended up getting a job at a, a local brokerage firm, and this is not to date myself, but a while back, uh, over 30 years ago now, I guess. And um, so I got a job, and uh, the person, it was back in those days, you know, there's a lot of cold calling and stuff like that that you don't really see today as much. But um, the guy that uh, hired me got me my stuff for study for the Series 7, and uh, it took a few weeks, studied by the pool, and then went in and took it and uh, started working for them immediately. And just from there, kind of wiggled my way around, graduated from college, moved to uh, another city and opened a brokerage firm with some guys um, and did that throughout the 90s. And then uh, eventually got out of that piece of the business and started TradeSite from an educational perspective. So um, your experience with uh, technical analysis, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at your charts right now, we don't have to switch to them yet, but uh, very, very technically based in nature. I mean, it, it seems to be the driving force. So just curious when you you got into technical analysis, was it through your brokerage or was it through your studies in La Jolla? Um, where did where did you get that uh, interest going? Yeah, so the brokerage firm that I worked at after college, not the one necessarily um, you know, when I was in college, um, I was very fortunate. I worked on the trading desk. Um, I ran the trades for all the brokers. They would call in their orders. I mean, this is like I said, 1993, 94, a while back when, when it wasn't really computerized from your house. And uh, I was very fortunate that a couple of the guys that were at one of our satellite offices, um, they were just really experienced technical traders. They worked with William O'Neill um, using the canceling method and some other stuff. And so I got to see how they were trading for their customers. And they taught me a lot while I was sitting there working a, a day job, right? So getting paid to do my job, but also learn about the markets. And, uh, you know, I just, I took it very seriously. And over the years, as we, uh, expanded into trade site, you know, we just found a lot of other tools that we found useful. And uh, now we've used, you know, we moved to Ninja uh, not too long ago and we got all the tools set up. And so we're just continuing on. That's great. Now, um, I like to say that there are, 
you know, in in the United States, let's say I'm going to confine it to this region. Uh, there are obvious hotspots of of what I would say technical analysis, Chicago and New York being two of them. And then there are some hotspots, or I shouldn't say hotspots, but um, unusual un, unusual levels of interest in technicals. And what I mean by that is people coming out of the same place. Richmond, Virginia, for me, is one of those spots. Um, La Jolla is becoming that spot now because one of my mentors came from La Jolla as well. And he came right out of school, went right into technical trading on the East Coast. He moved to the East Coast. But um, it seems like maybe there's somebody there, somebody in the area that might be, uh, like you said, William O'Neill. Um, you know, I don't know if William O'Neill is based on the West Coast, uh, but. No, so certainly he he wasn't, but he you know they did traveling shows all over the country. You know they did yeah. these big events and and trained people and um you know they had these great books that had all the charts that came out every weekend and I'd go through the charts. They'd be delivered on a Sunday FedEx, and I'd go into the office and just study the charts as much as I could and find ideas for the next week. And uh, yeah, but he he traveled everywhere, uh, not just on the on the West Coast. But we did have Orange County at the time was pretty hot for trader groups and stuff like that. We worked with a lot of those people back in the 90s and on. Um, and it still is a pretty big area for that. That's great. That's great. Well, um, so you, you started TradeSite. What, what year did you start that? 2002. I, I got out of the uh, brokerage side um, in 2001, actually just after 9-11. Um, and then it took me a little while to decide what else I wanted to do. And uh, actually, initially, I wasn't going to really do anything. I was just uh, trading my own money and, and stuff like that. But I had a couple clients that had uh, I'd worked with for years. And they said, hey, if you're still doing market research for yourself, you know, can we pay you to get some of that research? And it just kind of went from there. They ended up making the website for me. Uh, and obviously, it's changed a lot over the years. But um, we just kind of, you know, I, I didn't think I was going to get back into that piece, but we ended up going that way. So you provided analysis for the brokerage uh, that eventually when the broker, when you sold the brokerage, you kept that piece going and that evolved into actually allowing customers using the tools. Is that it? Yeah. I mean, it wasn't so much that I was providing for the brokerage itself, but I, over years after I learned so much from those guys, um, I ended up, you know, getting my own customers and uh, I was putting on events here in Phoenix um, and I'm picking up customers and, and sort of helping them you know, manage their money or place their trades. And uh, so that, that's just, you know, I kind of made my own way in that area. Um, I had some tools that I used that weren't the same as the ones that the guys I had learned so much from. And uh, so then when we went to trade site, we just kind of, you know, it was, again, it was just a, somebody said, Hey, I really want your stuff still. I know you're doing the research. And I said, okay, sure. I guess we'll figure it out. And then all of a sudden it was a website. And then all of a sudden we were marketing to the website and all of a sudden we had all these customers again. So I was back in the game, which I really had not thought I was going to be. So when you when you had your brokerage, it was uh, mostly equities you were focusing on. Did you did you do futures trading as well, or was it mostly equities? Equities and options. Um, I've always okay. been big with options. Um, even I mean, my, my first trade I ever did, and I was a kid with my dad. Uh, you know, uh, before I was old enough to really have my own account or anything like that, was options. I mean, I studied options on my own at like age fourteen. I just found them very interesting. And they made a lot of sense to me. So. Uh, equities and options, and then we did. We didn't really get to the future stuff until the mid two thousands, basically. Yeah, I, I think you're the first person I know whose first trade was an option trade, not not the stock that they read about, or or you know their their parents helped them with that. That's really interesting. I think that's great. Um, yeah, it was it was on it was on Time Warner, by the way, TWX back when oh. that was the uh, that was the first. We bought some calls and made some money. That was the first. That's how I got excited. You know, you make money on your first trade ever. You're going to be in the business for a while. So. Right, right. It's yeah, certainly that uh, that rush of of having a positive trade is is in you know it helps helps guide you. I think the rest of your 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 career it yeah. certainly helps it. Yep. Um, so that's interesting. TWX before they bought didn't they they bought AOL right and that yep. that changed. Yeah, that was later in the nineties, I think, the late nineties uh, before the crash. But yeah, interesting. That's great. So yep. uh, you know maybe we can pivot to see exactly, you know, kind of the tools. So you developed a, a, a way of identifying uh, recommendations for your clients in the newsletter. Is that right? Yeah, it was originally just a newsletter and I, you know, I gave them, I, I was really a lot about chart patterns back when I started it. Um, like I said, the, the William O'Neill system is a, is a lot of like cup and handles and, you know, different types of patterns. Back then, 
you know, I was working on the trading desk, but, you know, the idea of quote unquote day trading, this is before that really like, you know, you couldn't, I mean, they place an order and it could take like an hour to get the fill back from the floor. So you can't exactly turn around and day trade it 20 minutes later, you know? Um, so it was really more, that's why there was a lot of options involved because we were looking at bigger time frames, daily charts and stuff like that um, and getting involved in trades for several days at a time. Um, and then of course, once kind of the internet thing hit and all the online stuff, we were able to take the same sort of knowledge base about chart patterns and stuff like that, but break it down into smaller time frames, And then you kind of, from there, you end up a little bit day trading. So I do, I still do both. Um, I'll do some options on longer term stuff and I'll do day trading on stocks and, and futures. Well, I think what's great about um, what you mentioned about chart patterns, for instance, is as a, as a, uh, an analyst, you really are just talking about what the chart pattern indicates. You're not necessarily giving a recommendation, right? Because you don't know exactly what your client's positions are and what their motivations are, but you can look at a chart and you can say, well, this cup and handle indicates this and doesn't mean it's going to happen. Nothing's we've said it before, right? Past performance isn't indicative of future results, but it also kind of gives you an idea of uh, probability loading, right? If you if you have enough of these indications, maybe it, you feel more secure in a decision you might make. Well, and it's also about identifying really important support resistance points, right? Um, and, you know, using those for entries uh, and exits of your of your trading. So, yeah, I mean, exactly that. It's you know, nothing's, certainly nothing's anywhere near 100%. But, um, you know, you have to have a system to at least lead you to what you think is good chart construction, um, a system to figure out what, where and why you would enter something. And then really the most important piece, and this is what we teach people all the time, you can do all that work. There's still going to be trades that don't work, plenty of them, right? But you have to have a good trade management system so that, um, you know, when things work, great. You, you let it do X, Y, and Z. And when they don't work, boom, you know, you're done with it and you move on. So, um, you know, that's all very important. It's not just about, you know, how do I find the stock to go buy? Exactly, exactly. And I would say that trade management is most, I wouldn't say by people like you, I'm just saying in general, new traders, they don't grasp that right away, right? right? It's it's all about trying to find the signal that I like, and um, but what happens if it doesn't work? I don't think is discussed nearly enough. Uh, we we try to highlight that. It sounds like that's focus for you as well. So I think that's great to hear, um, right? Because nothing is a hundred percent. Maybe it's a good time to to jump into uh, you know kind of your your idea of. Uh, what might be a good trade setup or, or what you look for when you're looking at an intraday chart. Uh, maybe we can pivot to the charts and just take a quick look. Yeah, I mean, I've got a couple of different of my workspaces uh, ready to go here. Um, this one that is being shown right now, I guess, is the uh, mostly my futures stuff, right? So what we do with futures, um, these charts are five-minute charts. Um, so, you know, with futures, it is more of an intraday type of thing for us. Um, and the lines you see, and I'm going to make... Uh, this chart a little bit bigger so everybody can kind of see it. Um, the lines you see on this chart are what we call our futures levels. And we calculate these every day. Um, the the shaded, like lighter gray area is what we call the value area. Um, and so this is the NQs. And then we've also got um, a pivot series. Uh, we've got some what we call GAN levels, which is the dark red. There's actually two dark red lines. Um, and we've got something called the the pivot uh, pressure threshold, sorry, um, which are the purple lines. And these all have different meanings. They're different types of calculations. Um, you know, every one of them is just something where we kind of analyze where we're at against those levels. And uh, for example, if you look at today's, um, you know, action to over here on the right side, um, you know, you can see that after we gapped down this morning, uh, we kind of rallied back up and we ran right into the value area. And that's a very important level is that value area. Um, and so a lot of times this is what we call setting the level, which basically means we came up, we hit it, the markets, you know, we knew that level was there. The market is saying, hey, yep, that's an important level. And then we watch it because now if it had gone sideways instead and broke it out through that level, I might have taken the trade long. Okay. And but it didn't, it stopped at that level because it's just such an important support resistance point. And each one of these in their own way and that, you know, everyone's a different calculation sort of uh, can be equally important. Um, the pressure thresholds, for example, which is the purple line here. Um, a lot of times once you break that or gap past it, you won't um, be able to get back above it for the day. Um, so you'll, we watch those carefully. Um, there's just a lot of different tools. And, you know, when you see, when you start to understand how each of these things works technically, and then you, see them working in conjunction, right? So maybe you line up 
you know, for example, the, uh, the the value area I was just mentioning here, the value area low is also lined up with the S1 level off the pivot series today. So there's two levels right there. You can barely tell because they're right on the same number, um, but they are both there, which makes it even more important. Um, so we we look at various factors and analyze the markets that way um, and then figure out what our entry points are. And then again, like I said, really important, especially with futures, uh, trade management. What do you do? How much are you risk, risking and, and you know, stuff like that. So um, that is a piece of what we do um, in futures is, is kind of walk off and teach people how to use these levels and guide them as to what the market's doing throughout the day. Um, today's kind of a boring day because it's the first day back from a three-day weekend. It's also the first day of the, you know, the February options expired on Friday. So we're kind of into the marches right now. So we're just kind of drifting down today, not a lot happening. But, um, you know, you do you do tend to see a lot of these levels get used and, and it gives us trade ideas. Um, so that's Chris, one real piece. quick. Yep. Can I, can we just go back to that chart? Can we just blow it up? Cause I want to do, I, I want to clarify <laughs> um, something. Now you mentioned this is a five minute chart yep. and um, you'll notice gap ups and gap down. I'm assuming not even talking to you about it beforehand. Those are regular trading hour charts. So you're not looking at the six o'clock to uh, you know, nine twenty nine portion of the chart. You're starting at nine thirty AM uh, Eastern. 9.30 a.m. Eastern to 4.15 p.m. Eastern to settlement um, is what these charts are. So we tend to, I mean, I do have a chart, like I'll leave a, I'll leave one of my workspaces up overnight. I call it my overnight layout and it'll run the 24 hour futures just so that when I come in, the first thing I see in the morning is what did the futures do overnight? But from a trading perspective, you know, the, the way that technicals work, you know, everything works better when there's good volume, right? And there's just such a difference in volume between the regular hours and what happens outside of that. So we kind of consider that noise when it comes to like the layouts and stuff like that. It's obviously interesting to start the day and take a look at what happened, but I wouldn't, you know, usually use it for trading. So um, just, that begs the question, you know, one of the things we talk about on our bookend shows is, you know, advantage futures because you can participate outside regular trading hours. Mm -hmm. With these charts, um, let's say there's a, a, you know, a CPI, PPI, GDP, whatever number it is at 830 in the morning, are you not even interested in trading for, you know, maybe you don't recommend that for your clients. It's not your style. Correct. Yeah. It, we don't, I don't touch anything outside of stock market hours except for Forex. Um, okay. Cause it really is different, but um, you know, the, the future stuff and the stock stuff, you know, I, I would say 90% of the work we do. Uh, is in the first two hours of the day, both when it comes to futures and stocks. So, um, you know, whether it's, you know, some kind of a breakout setup or some type of reversal setup, I mean, we kind of track both in different ways. Um, you know, all the action, you can see on the charts, I'm sure most of your followers know this, but, you know, look at the volume down at the bottom. And obviously the biggest chunk of the volume is in the first two hours of the day, typically. So, you know, that's when it's the most technical, if you will. Um, and that's why we we typically just trade that. Right. We call that the volume smile, just so you know. Yeah, uh, that's right. I'm sure you've heard that before. Yeah. Um, great. So just want to, you know, clarify and you can you can have your chart look like Chris's uh, just by adjusting the the time when you go to the setup of the chart. You can adjust it to regular trading hours or even I think you can even specify the specific time period. So Chris uses 415. That's settlement of the stock market itself. Right. I made yeah. a custom trade because you can go into your tools and your trading hours. And I actually made some customized you know, trading hour settings so that it goes from yeah. 930 to, you know, um, I, even though I'm in Phoenix, you know, I'd set my whole system up here. So it's on Eastern time. Um, it just makes it easier, especially for our customers, because we have them everywhere. So we just all focus on saying things in terms of Eastern time. And then uh, yeah. and then I made some, like I said, trading hour blocks that are based on, you know, those hours, because with futures, I think one mistake people make because the technical levels which we calculate here are so important all the way to settlement. And a lot of people, uh, I see a lot of tools out there that only go till four o'clock. And so you're missing that back 15 minutes. Um, and that part is important. It's not as much the overnight stuff. It's, it's that extra 15 minutes. Right. And we see it in the futures market, right? Yeah. After four o'clock, it's not that the volume drops to zero or next to zero. There is still some volume at four, you know, that, that yep. next five minute candle and a little bit less the next five minute candle, but that's because you know, other things are going on, right? A lot of uh, important companies or big companies, I should say, they report earning, earnings at four o'clock, four o five. Sure. So you know you catch that as well. But you're right. Yep. You know if if there's still activity in the stock index future or in the stock in market, then then going to four fifteen, of course, you'd get you get the benefit of uh, seeing that volume as well. 
Right. And and while I have this chart up, actually, there's you, know, you might see these numbers. There's these numeric counts. Um, on, and this is a what we call a bar counting methodology um, that measures energy in the market really more than anything. I might take me a couple hours to go through the math, so I won't bother with everybody right now <laughs> with that. But um, but what we're looking for is uh, in this particular chart, when you see the light blue numbers, what you're looking for is if you've had a decent move, when you get to the 13 count, that is often the reversal point. And so, like I said, like sometimes we might be looking for breakout plays, but sometimes we're looking for reversal plays. And so this was, I guess, what this would be last Wednesday on the NQs. And you can see we came off the lows and we had a pretty good move up. And yes, it was very late in the day, you know, 20 minutes before the close or so, but we got the 13 uh, reversal signal and that was the top, right, for the day. So it gives you sort of a setup for what is uh, a potential move down. Um, I think if I go back on the ES... Yeah, so on Thursday, I'm sorry, this is Thursday now in the ES, you can see you had the move up and there's your 13 and that's literally the high candle of the day. And then there was more time left in the day on that one because it kind of came midday. And so, um, it, you know, we got a decent roll over there. So some days you don't get that signal at all. You can see in the last week, it's just been, you know, that one here and, and the one on the NQs, but it is a, a tool we really like to use for reversals. Well, and I, I like the fact that you have different tools that measure different aspects of the market right you've got something that's talking about trend like you just explained and then you've got levels that could be support or resistance um you know based on different things that value area we talk about value area in terms of um the order flow uh volume profile and this is a different type of of value area or is well, it something no like it's it? still based on the volume profile um it, it's just that the way we trade it, there's a couple of different things, right? If if you start your day inside the value area, and, and keep in mind what you're seeing on this chart, this is just today's value area, even though it goes all the way back, you know, we could, this is just for today. So if you start your day inside the value area, a lot of times you won't, it won't be easy to get out of the value area. Um, meanwhile, if you kind of gap like we did today, then moving towards the value area, that, like I said, can be a resistance point. But if you can break into the value area from there, um, you know, you often get a move. Now you're stuck back in the rain. So now maybe you're going to, you know, go along by the futures going into the value area here, figuring that you've got this whole area you might cover. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that is interesting. It's almost like magnets of sorts, right? Yes. It, they're repelling until you overcome it and then they're keeping you trapped in there. Yep. Um, and of course, past performance, not indicative of future results, but that's what the study indicates or the levels indicate. Uh, right. For a higher probability right it's like so, and, you know we talk about trade management you know i mean again if you're taking a trade like that you know you're going to keep your risk to a certain level right but yet you have all this upside potentially right if this is the zone that it kind of goes into so you know again it's just it's not that it, like you said nothing like close to 100 percent of the trades work it's just how do you get in how do you decide what's an important entry point and then being strict about your management and and how you deal with it from there is really the whole key and those levels again can be used for management, right? So mm -hmm. not not just getting into a trade, but also if the trade doesn't go your way, where where would you find support or resistance in the other other direction as well, right? Right, and and even more important is yes, well yes and no for us because if it goes against you, we only risk a certain amount, and I won't get into what that is, but we only risk sure. a certain amount per trade. Um, and that's it. It's we don't let things get to big losses or anything like that. Um, but when it's working then it's where's the next resistance point on the upside and it's going your way what, what kind of resistance point might we run into uh, that would let us know hey this is probably a place to take you know a piece of that trade out or something like that so you know to make sure. it just give you an example on this one if we had this is the nqs again if we had broken into the value area today um you know this red line is what we call our lower break uh, that's a gan level it's a gan calculation and you know that would have been a point where if we get up there you might want to take piece of the trade off type of thing. So you just, you have all these key support resistance points to work off of. So can we talk about GAN real quick? Cause I want your opinion, Chris, on GAN levels. I know uh, the original GAN levels or, or GAN diagrams, whatever you call them, they were based on a $1 per one day move, right? That was the original. And that goes back, I don't know how many decades. Yep. Um, but with the advent of technology, just like you mentioned, you were you started in a brokerage and orders were placed on the telephone and now they're you can you can do a lot more day trading or or in and out real quick with a computer 
Right. GAN technology seems to me GAN's work is affected by that because he was very much about 45 degree angle, one one by one rises or two by one or three by one, et cetera, et cetera. But now that I can adjust my chart, what am I missing? What? what, what yeah, but missing? The, cal the, the calculations still hold. Now we use, well, first of all, GAN has a lot. Okay. There's not just, yeah. like you said, there's a, you, you can read the book on GAN. There's a lot of different things. And, and I've, I've seen tried. That. Yeah, I've tried. Or if, if if you can read it, it's it's let's call it let's call it dense. It's pretty thick, right? Yeah. But uh, we focus on just one piece, and so our levels calculate one type of a GAN calculation. And when you have, if like you reference the eighth, it's the zero eighth, the four eighths, and the eight eighths level are really yeah. the ones that we tend to focus on because they they are very strong levels. Um, they do affect the market, and um, especially for intraday trading on on futures and even on stocks. So uh, we we just focus on that. He has a lot more. You can throw the kitchen sink in. Yeah with what he's got. <laughs> I'm going to have to dig my GAN book out. I, I know I had it for uh, the CMT tests I took and uh, yeah. maybe I didn't do so well on that point, but no, thanks for that. That, yeah. that, that really does help um, yeah. explain GAN a lot. And uh, you know, maybe my interpretation of, of the technology is, is misapplied. So I will, I will re reset on that. Thanks for that, yeah. Chris. Yeah. Well, like I said, there, he's got all sorts of like circles, looks like crop circles. And so like, like that's, yeah. We don't we don't do a stuff that that that's not okay. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, so okay. So now we're focusing on intraday. Um, these are intraday charts, five minute charts. Do you do you have do you look at um, historical charts for any type of guidance there? And and what are you what are your charts looking or what do you use um, uh, to look at those historical charts? Well, so this I just flipped here to a different workspace. This is that was all futures, right? This is my one of my stock workspaces. Sure. Um, and, and so, you know, to me, you know, newer traders, we see it all the time when we're training people, right? The, they, they make a mistake if they go, okay, today I want to go trade this stock and they pull up a five minute chart or even a one minute chart or something. And that's, and they think that's it. That's all the information that they need. And they're going to work off of that and, and try to do something with it. And, you know, what we always try to teach people is it, it's, I mean, I hate to say it's more complicated, but it is, it's more complicated than that. And we need to look at multiple time frames before we decide to take a trade and not even that but if you're dealing with stocks it's actually important what's going on in the futures market and we have ways of tracking um you know how we look at whether we're looking for long side trades or short trade short side trades uh depending on what's going on in the in the ES in particular um but then once you have that you got to look at bigger time frames so again what I, what I've got here are six of these charts um and I'm going to expand one of them in a second but we like to look at the five minute, which is down in the lower left, and that's just today's, you know, usually today and a little bit of yesterday's action. Um, sorry. Uh, and uh, oh, that was not supposed to happen. Hang on. Um, and then we've got the 15 minute chart. Uh, we've got the 30 minute chart. Um, and we've got a 65 minute chart. Now, each of these is getting bigger time frame, right? So the reason we do the 65 for stocks, um, it's kind of an institutional thing, is if you take a, the stock market from 9 30 in the morning until four, it's six and a half hours, right? So people do a 60 minute chart. You're either going to have a half, like a 30 minute bar somewhere, uh, either at the front or end of the day. And that doesn't really make the, the technicals even. So when you do a 65 minute chart, the day conveniently goes exactly to six candles. And that just makes it easier to keep your technicals, you know, properly aligned. Um, so we, we do like that time frame, and then the daily and the weekly. And what I'm going to do here is I'll just take this as a meta for me, knows Facebook, obviously. Uh, this is a 65 minute time frame. So you talk about different time frames and historical stuff and and you know, not just day trading. Uh, this is the type of setup we would look for maybe for an options trade because on a 65 minute time frame, which is such a big time frame, um, this was meta and it, you know, you can see we talked about the counts a minute ago and getting to the 13s. And meta gapped up on earnings, you know, back whatever this is, about two and a half weeks ago now, I guess, three weeks ago. And you can see that there was already a count in place. It's the red numbers here. And when we gapped up on a 65 minute time frame, there's a 13 reversal potential signal. And so for me on that big of a time frame, you know, I'm not going to just day trade it for an hour or something like that. I'm going to go get right. some options and and figure out a way to, to look at, you know, making money over a course of a couple of days or something like that. And so again, historically, you need to look at more than just what's going on today on a five minute chart. Too many people, I think, you know, make that type of mistake. Right. We use, we use the historical charts, the daily charts, the weekly charts to help see what our bias is, right? What has the right. market been doing? Um, but you took it one step further with that 65 minute chart. That indication is a longer indication 
So it's not like you're just trying to look for short setups today. That indication was more of a longer trend. Right. So it's it's not necessarily day trading. It could be swing trading. It could be um, maybe it's a week that you hold that. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But it's yep. it's really about the the indication in that in that sense. Right. And, you know, like, for example, here's another 65 minute chart of S FSLR for solar, you know, and here's one where, again, you can watch that. Now, this was a downward count, um, but you can see that yeah, we kind of had a gap down day here. It might have been on earnings again. This was just a week ago. And that gap down produced the 13 reversal signal. And then, you know, it takes a couple of days for it to move up. So, again, you wouldn't really necessarily want to day trade that. Um, but you know, doing some options work, stuff like that, that, you know, at least keeps it to a certain amount of money in the trade and, and you know, still gets the benefit of making something if it works in the right direction. You know, that's that's kind of what we look for. Right. And again, past performance, not indicative. I mean, these signals could fail Correct. Um, or, or not do what you want. Right. They right. could give an indication and then the market, something changes and it, it, it doesn't go the way you want. So just, again, that risk management, putting your stops in very, very key here. Well, and, and I can, again, I'm not going to dig into all the math in, in the time we have, but just to give you a general idea, for example, on the trade, there's also a 13 here uh, back a ways. Um, there was an upward move, a big upward move, and we had a 13 reversal signal. The nice thing about this tool, not only does it measure energy in the market, but it gives you an actual, this, this purple line that you can maybe just barely see um, right here is actually what we call the risk line. And so, if you were to take a reversal trade off of this, our stop would be triggered by uh, the candle closing above the risk line and then taking out the high of that candle in the next candle. So we have a very like, this is the stop out point, right? This is it. We, we know what that is going in so that we don't have a huge amount of risk. Um, and then, you know, obviously if the trade does work, then you've got whatever to the downside to try to make the money. Nice, nice, I like it. So. Um, so obviously some of these indicators can be used intraday and historical, right? Right. Yeah. And like, here's i I'll show you just the 15 minute chart of a GILD Gilead. Um, you know, so on a, on this time frame, we use, there's a slightly different mathematical count. So it's a, it's a, what we call magenta count, the pinkish numbers here. And so this is a 15 minute time frame. So this to me might've been more of a day trade, right? So the stock comes down here and the first candle of this day is a 13 reversal signal, right? And it's only on a 15 minute time frame. So this isn't something I'd want to get in and go, okay, this might take weeks to play out. You know what I mean? This is something I want to get in just for a shorter term time frame, And, you know, even just for that day, for example, and that would have been fine, you know? Right. The shorter term time frames on the charts indicate a faster environment or a shorter term that you might participate in the market. Um, and then, of course, everything will be tightened up accordingly. Right. Tighten up your stops, tighten up your targets uh, based on that shorter time frame. Yep, that's correct. I mean, you'll find them, you know, even like I said, this is a weekly chart. You can find these signals, you know, on different time frames. Here's a weekly chart of uh, Goldman Sachs, for example. You know, but then now to take this, remember, every candle's a week. <laughs> so, right. you know, you've really got to get into some deeper options to give this thing time to kind of play out after getting the signal because it's it's not going to just happen, you know, necessarily overnight. So, you know, every time frame is just played a little bit differently. Um, and, and like I said, the bigger the time frame, the more meaningful I think the signals are. But also then maybe you look at something like options or something so that you're just letting it play out over time. So um, for those of you watching on YouTube, thanks for for watching and you can hit the thumbs up, hit the subscribe, share the link. We'd love that. But if you want to participate in the chat, if you want to ask Chris a question, you can come to ninjatrader.com slash events and hit the play button. When you do that, you'll get the video, but you'll also be able to enter a handle and put a question in for Chris. So um, if you have any questions for Chris, feel free to do that. Um, so, you know, we're looking at, you focus mainly on equities markets, whether they're um, the actual uh, individual stocks or the futures market for the stock. And do you look at any other futures? Uh, we want, well, we monitor crude oil and gold. Um, we are in the process of adding. So we, like I said, we generate these levels for the futures. Uh, we do it on the ES, the NQs, the Russell um, and uh, and then gold and, and crude oil. But we're looking now at, uh, we have a lot of customers over in Europe and stuff like that. So we're looking at the FTSE and the DAX and adding the same levels um, to those, I think, shortly. We just, like I said, got all this stuff programmed up for Ninja over the last uh, couple of months. So we're still adding pieces. Would it be all right to take a look at a gold chart? I know gold, we were looking at this morning, big move in gold. 
um, seem to to retrace a little bit. Um, just curious to see what your levels were in gold and how it, how it uh, traded in those levels. Yeah, so I had mentioned what we call the pressure thresholds, which are the purple lines on these charts. There's one kind of up here, but there's also one right here. And you can see that that, to me, that's those are usually very important levels. Um, they often determine sort of where the range of the day could be, like the max range. If you don't get some kind of big news event to get you moving, um, you know, it's it's often contained within those two ranges. And as you can see, you know, today, we also spent a lot of time here in the value area, which is that shaded area. But then we did dip underneath it. And look where we found support right now. It's right there at that pressure threshold level. So, you know, again, kind of doing its thing. Um, you know, I, I call this a contained day. Um, you know, there's just not a lot of action, you know, in this kind of back and forth. But um, overall, and we, by the way, we haven't even had a signal, like one of those 13 signals in the last week on this. So it's just really has been kind of flat. Right. We've we've looked at this. We've thought that uh, it's been consolidation mode, even longer term. We're looking at a daily chart. Today, we came to the conclusion, I think it was crude, that, yeah, value area trading seemed to be possibly in play. Certainly range mount. It didn't seem directional today, but that, you know, big move up. And we were looking at the full range of the day. So there was a downtrend, sure. obviously, gap down when, you know, you have the open. Now, do you use the stock market open or you use the uh, regular trading hours? For I use the regular trading hours for the for each symbol. So, you know, crude oh, okay. is a little different than gold. Right. So like nine o'clock, 830, whatever it is. Right. So, yeah, so, we, you know, it's interesting that value area is kind of where we, we saw it as well, um, but very nicely displayed on this visual because I like the way it, it kind of tracks back, right? It, it goes, even though it's today's, you can see wh where else has we have we found support or resistance or found consolidation congestion in the same area? And you can go back and think, okay, well, what happened on Friday? You know, oh, Friday, you know, this was the news or this was what was happening. And and you can uh, and I'm I guess what are we looking at? We're still looking at crude, right? So, I just yeah, I just put it back to crude instead of gold, but yeah, yeah. Well, and so, and the other thing is that the way we designed the tool. Um, if I right click and I go into my indicators, um, and the pops up the box here, right? Um, I can actually put a specific date, uh, in here. So what it would then do is if like if I was to put last Friday's date in here, it would draw the levels as they were on Friday. So I can see oh, nice. I can go back and, and look at that, and we. Um, I mean, we've got, uh, in most of the cases, I think we've got about 14 years worth of that. Um, you can go backwards and test and do all sorts of fun stuff with it. So, And you can overlay what's there now. So could I overlay, instead of replacing the value area for today with value area from Friday, could I overlay the two, see where they... No, you have to pick one of the two right now. I mean, it. It, gets, it gets too... We've looked at that, but it gets too much. You know what I mean? Like you got... Right. It, it's a lot of lines. <laughs> it's it's congested, yeah, certainly, yeah. and and um, simplicity is, I think, in some ways, the name of the game, and and certainly, uh, you know, this yeah. this makes it simple. Um, yep. And then we so we looked at crude, we looked at gold. I'm curious to look at the Russell. You have the Russell right there. I, I'd love to see the Russell because it's certainly acting a little bit differently today. Yeah. So what's interesting, I mean, yeah, it is a little bit weaker than the other stuff, right? But again, it gapped down just like the market did and and blew through, you know, I mean, it's below most of the key levels. It, it was already down the S2 level pretty quickly. Um, the one thing I would say here again is this one on the, on the five minute time frame, which again is a very small time frame comparatively, has this 13 uh, reversal signal here today. And you know, the risk line for that so far, which you can barely see is the purple line right in there, that's been holding it. So even, mm -hmm. even though we have, we have a big move down, 13 potential reversal signal, and the risk line is basically the support area off of that. And that's about what you would expect uh, with that. Because again, it's measuring energy in the market and you get enough movement that it's got to kind of release a little bit. And that's kind of what we're seeing. Um, I should also point out, we have a thing called average daily range. And so mm -hmm. uh, on the futures and on Forex um, and now on stocks as well. And so what'll happen is uh, because we've made a move down, this green line right here, it anchors to the high of the day. And then basically we take a six month average of you know how many points, how many ticks does the Russell trade on average over the last six months on a daily basis. And we project that number down here to a red line. So what you can see is we haven't even quite traded yet average daily range, but we're very close today, right? We're almost there. And you know, you'll find a lot of times that those are sort of like again reversal points. If it's made that big of a move that it's the average, a lot of times you'll get sort of a pause. Yeah, I like that. And we, Jim and I were doing something similar with the E-mini today. Um, and it was very, it wasn't as calculated as yours. You know, it was, 
I think this is what the average true range is for the <laughs> E-mini. Let's call it, let's round it up, right? And But right. the same process, right? We hit a high up here, we're trending down. Let's see how far that can reach. You're just being more uh, um, scientific about it, right? Yeah, we're, um, we're trying to get, you know, we, we want it to be very visual for people on the charts so that, you know, and yes, precise uh, too, so that, you know, you can come in every day and you just, you see where it's going to be, right? It's going to be, okay, here's the average daily range. We're moving down. So the top line's anchored and, you know, where would we have to get to, to, to have traded that average daily range and just see it right there. Um, you know, we do that with several tools, uh, even right here on this chart, uh, for example, because we had a decent gap today. Uh, this is the ES again, but this just looking at it with a different set of tools, but this kind of orange or gold line, what that is, is it's what we call the half gap fill. So what it does is it takes from the prior day's close to today's open and puts a line exactly halfway in between because a lot of times if you, it's almost like a fib, right? A lot of times if you get a, a move back up, a 50% move back up, that's where you'll pause off. That's kind of like a gut reaction. Uh, we didn't quite get there today, but you know, a lot of times you'll see it happen. Now you can see it actually on this one, you know, here was a day where we gapped down and ran right into that orange line, right? And uh, so again, that's that's another thing we look at. When you don't really have a gap, it's not useful. But when you have a gap, it can be useful. Right. That's really interesting. I've never thought of measuring the gap using FIB levels. Now, the 50% is a FIB level, but it could be just a 50% retracement. But that's really interesting, a really interesting way of looking at it because you're right, you gap down, often you see a, a rebound, or if you gap up, you see a pullback um, of you know people taking profit, of getting out of positions, and they're, that just cause an elevation or a, a de decrease in the other side. Right. Um, but measuring that is really smart. I like that. And we do it in stocks too. So if, you know, that same tool can be applied uh, to a stock chart. So if you get a gap in a stock, you can see where the 50% retracement would be. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Just, you know, in the teachings of the CMT or Market Technicians uh, Association, you know, one of the things is about gaps and it's fairly basic, right? Market doesn't like gaps. We want to close the gap. In the futures market, we don't see a lot of gaps, except this is a way to see it, right? You're you're using a different time period um, based on the underlying market. And that's where we see gaps, right? Because right. something happens overnight, something happens, you know, futures are trading, but the underlying isn't. So you do see gaps there. We don't see it in the in the futures market so much, but we do if we shorten the hours to those time frames. So I guess that's kind of obvious, but um, when you get used to looking at futures markets, you know, you might hear something about gaps. You're like, there are no gaps, right? We trade, right. We trade the same tick, the next bar, right? right. So um, really, really interesting to take a look at. Well, and let me let me just add real quick. I'll put this on here and show you. Um, so this is I said I had that one chart that I use that's like the overnight. Um, so you know, this this runs the ES twenty four hours a day, right? So this is where you wouldn't have a gap, right? Because as you're seeing the whole thing, and you know you'll still see that these levels will be will be addressed and used overnight. They're not completely you know ignored, um, but you know look at the difference in the volume. Once the this is where the market <laughs> opens, you know what I mean. So I mean that's really that's where the game is, and uh, so to have you know, that part of it and see the gaps off of that and not focus on that overnight stuff. I think it's really important. No, I agree. I, I, I do see that and, and very easy to see with your volume uh, indicator there. Um, Chris, we're running up against time. So I know we could probably spend another couple hours here talking <laughs> about charts and, and looking at examples, but I want to give our audience a chance to do that with you. So um, can you just, uh, can you just let everybody know what, where they can find you and, oh. and anything coming up? Sure. Um, so this is the website. Uh, this is tradesite.com. Um, it's spelled S I G H T trade site. Um, and uh, we have, I'm going to log out of it here so that you can actually see the homepage as it uh, is usually. <laughs> um, but we, uh, we basically help people learn any, anything, you know, if they want to learn about stocks or futures or Forex um, or options, you know, we have a course that basically all of it, and we take six months to go and teach you everything that we can. And then we have a regular subscription service where we analyze the market all day long and we kind of walk you through some of these signals and, and stuff like that. Um, we do have a, uh, with Ninja, with you guys, uh, a free webinar coming up on March 23rd. Uh, which I think is a Thursday, um, where we're going to cover one of our tools. It's called the pressure thresholds. Um, we're going to talk about that for stocks and futures. Um, and then, uh, you know, other than that, we're constantly uh, helping people guide them through the markets every day and uh, 
training them as much as we can on you know all of our tools and how we've how we think and approach the markets. Great, Chris, that that's incredible, and I hope you viewers can can make the webinar on uh, March twenty third. And will they will they have information about that on your website? How to get there? We will, and I think. You know, like I said, I think Ninja, I think you guys are sending some stuff out as well about it um, when we get closer to the date. But yes, right. uh, it'll be, we'll have stuff up uh, here as we get closer. Awesome. Chris, thanks for coming on and spending time with us. Um, really insightful. So I, I really enjoyed it. Yep. And, thanks for uh, having me. Sure. We'll have you back on. Uh, and uh, if I get out to Phoenix, I'm going to look you up. Okay. I'm here. My favorite place in the country, Phoenix. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I want to thank all you viewers for coming as well. And uh, Jim Cagnina will be back for Bar's Closing. We'll talk to you later. Take care.